issue I wanted to raise before I take my seat. And it has to do with a very disturbing matter that would have been brought to my attention yesterday by five separate individuals who had seen it on social media. And it has to do with the fact that there was a one-time honorarium that was paid to the task force for COVID-19. The task force for COVID-19 is a task force that has provided stellar service to the country. Every, every single member state in CARICOM looked to our model and copied it. Because we had, by their, by their assessment, what can be considered the best build out of a COVID response through the length and breadth of CARICOM. The data also supports the type of yeoman service that would have been expended by keeping our rates of death very low. I think up till now we only have had, what, 40, 40, 43 deaths, and our caseload is still relatively low in terms of serious infection and the need for hospitalizations, etc. Nobody, when they joined this task force, did it for what they could get out of it. It was national service. We were facing a crisis that could have wiped us out because we are the smallest member state in CARICOM with the smallest pool of resources, health-wise and otherwise. Thankfully, and the Prime Minister alluded to this, because of prudent fiscal management of this country, we were able to build into the health system the type of capitalization that put us in extremely good stead to be able to withstand the challenges that would have confronted us in terms of the medical response that was required. Up until when we would have gotten into the throes of COVID by around 20, 2020 April or May, St. Kitts and Nevis, in spite of being a tiny country, would have had something like at least 30 ventilators attached to JNF Hospital. Am I correct, Dr. Wilkinson and CMO? And that is tremendous because it came at a time when ventilators were in scarce supply, but we had ordered early. We began planning for COVID as early as December of 2019 when we saw the writing on the wall, even though it took until March 11th for the World Health Organization to declare it a pandemic. The work of the task force was carried out and is still being carried out, by the way, because we had a meeting up to last Tuesday by a wide cross-section of public sector stakeholders with their own set of specialist skills, leadership acumen, professional know-how, and of course, a heart of love for their own country. And they gave without counting the cost. They gave without counting the amount of time they would have spent away from family members. They gave of their leisure time. There were days and months when we came to this very room day after day after day during lockdown, when everybody else was in their homes. Over time, the commendations of the task force went far and wide, even as far as our diaspora. And then, over time, it was thought that there needed to be a tangible way to say thank you to the people of this country who went above and beyond to keep all of us safe, and they're still doing that job. I should indicate that yesterday, what I would have referred to earlier in terms of five people sending me interventions um, that were on social media was that portions of a cabinet submission to be precise for the, um, the sake of clarity and documentation for the media houses present, that cabinet submission was number 236 of 2021. The cabinet submission was drafted on or about the 6th of December 2021, following almost two months of discussion between the Cabinet and the Ministry of Finance as to an appropriate mechanism or framework with which to say thank you to the task force. The submission was finally dealt with by the middle of January, and I have to put even the way it was dealt with in context for us here. At that meeting of the Cabinet, and the uh, Cabinet Secretary, you're here. Um, do you remember the exact date of that meeting? The 10th of January. So I wasn't too far when I said it was dealt with by the middle of January. On the 10th of January, every single Cabinet member, save for the Honorable Attorney General, was present at Cabinet. 
when that agenda item came up for that meeting and I recognized that it was going to be the next item for discussion, I recused myself from the cabinet meeting because I knew that in addition to the persons who were being proposed for an honorarium, the names of Vincent Byron and Wendy Phipps were on that list. And it was the appropriate thing to have done to exit the room so that I do not influence a discussion in which the outcome would more than likely see me being a beneficiary for an honorarium. After the matter had been discussed for about 15 minutes, I was called back to the cabinet room and we joined the meeting. And at that point, I would have been informed of the cabinet's decision. By the 21st of January, acting on the instruction of the cabinet secretary, who would, according to her practice, send the cabinet decision for that, of that nature to the office of the financial secretary, the payments were made to the members of the task force. The payments were done rather discreetly right in this very building on Friday, the 21st of January, with a senior official from the Ministry of Finance being present to present and to have signed for them the same beneficiaries who were asked to walk with an ID. Now, as I said, that was January 21st. February 21st came, no leaking of anything. March 21st came, no leaking of anything. April 21st came, no leaking of anything. And now we are down to the 31st of May. And yesterday that happened. I do not want to surmise or to second guess or to try to figure out who did what and why. But what I do know is that cabinet documents are privileged documents. People who sit in a cabinet have to take an oath of office before you can assume any type of role in the cabinet. What was done yesterday, and to a certain extent I can only say that it was done in retaliation for my statements last Friday, because the graphic that I saw only had one person's picture on it, and it was mine. But my position is that if you want to take issue with a minister of government over a payment that that minister of government receives, you have no business whatsoever compromising senior civil servants in that process. <laughs> what I saw yesterday had all of the names of all of the beneficiaries, plain as day, and I do not know what was the aim of all of that. Nobody on the task force stole any money. Nobody on the task force begged to have an honorarium, but they were duly presented with an honorarium. This type of information being circulated on social media doesn't help anybody. And what it does is engender further distrust in terms of your access to government, especially when matters have to come before the cabinet. So the average person might be out there wondering right now, what happens to me if, for example, like the example I gave you earlier, of 44 businesses applying to the Ministry of Trade for a relief, for fiscal relief, to get their businesses up and running or to relieve some of their operational costs. What is to happen to those who are still in the process of sending in their applications? Are they supposed to now feel threatened or afraid at being exposed even to their competitors, for example, which is serious, that something as, as simple and which is their entitlement to access as an application for fiscal incentives in the past might very well find itself on social media. So I think sometimes when we do these things, the person or persons who are responsible, we need to take time and think about the implications for everybody. And I will end on that note, and I will pray that as we move forward, we would recognize that social media serves a good, but it also has its bad sides. But let us continue to try to use it for the good that we can get out of it. We are a people who have come very far, and for what I have just explained, it really sinks to a new law, and we need to do better as a country. I thank you for your attention.